Welcome to The Christian Atheist, where faith and reason fuse in the Incarnation. Episode number three, The Machinery of the Looking Glass, part two. Lessons from the Classroom. Last week, we discussed my highest value, truth, and how its pursuit took me, eventually, to atheism. This week, I would like to continue to examine the path that led me to a self-confrontation before the looking glass in July of 2019, and the subsequent stunning reversal of a 25-year commitment to atheism. My current position on atheism and atheists is quite different from that of most Christians. I consider atheism a rational choice in light of the evidence available to us, though obviously not, as a Christian, the best choice. I find little value in trading arguments. Having been an atheist for 25 years, I'm not really impressed by arguments for God's existence, or in the various arguments atheists offer against it. The latter neither frighten me nor threaten my faith in God, not because they are weak or irrational, but because they are, in an important sense, beside the point, or directed to a different level of analysis. I will try to unpack this different level of analysis in upcoming episodes of our podcast. My belief in God is rationally settled for me, not in the sense that it is beyond question, but in the sense that barring serious evidentiary contradiction, questions about God, even his existence, only serve to deepen my fascination with and commitment to truth, and thus to Christ. I have found it difficult to tease apart the various threads that led me to step back through the looking glass. The story is complex, deeply intertwined, and neither simple nor easy to explain. I despair of doing justice to its complexity or God's sovereign control. Whereas last week I presented a static principle that guided and still guides me, this week I concentrate on a trajectory a learning curve that altered my perspective dramatically over many years. It was through teaching Socrates and Plato for over a decade in my introduction to philosophy courses in the university classroom that I came to see more deeply into the nature of philosophical understanding. As a lover of truth, seeking to understand our world, I had an ever-growing sense that something was profoundly wrong with our culture generally, and with academic culture specifically. This was built on an insight from my high school years when I first became aware of socio-political reality. There was something rotten in the heart of our worldview that made me unable to find a resting place, either among Christians or academics, something everyone assumed without question, a fundamental deception that was so open so obvious and blatant that its very openness hid it from sight. The problem is philosophical, and while I can point to it in this edition, in a way the whole purpose of this podcast, The Christian Atheist, is devoted to its elucidation. The West is engaged in a titanic struggle between two philosophical giants, Kant and Hegel. And although few in today's world, including most philosophers, have more than a shallow understanding of Hegel, he is winning. Kantian forces push back, but we have been snowed under by an avalanche of the intelligentsia, media, and political elite for many decades, all unconscious Hegelians. If you haven't guessed, I side with Kant, and have for my entire career, though sorting out the alliances, isn't always easy. My intro to philosophy course is a comparison contrast of two of the most important and inseparable voices in the Western tradition, Socrates and Plato. Socrates is fairly called the father of Western philosophy, and Plato was his most famous pupil. Socrates wrote nothing, so most of what we know about him comes from Plato. Socrates' philosophical practice consisted almost entirely of asking questions of his fellow Athenians, challenging their claims to knowledge on a variety of topics. The result of Socratic questioning was almost invariably the discovery that the person Socrates was questioning was unable to adequately defend 
their understanding of the topic. In Socratic chess, Socrates seldom lost, and he made a lot of enemies showcasing the arrogant ignorance of the intelligentsia of his day, the sophists, who mirror our day's social elite. Ultimately, Socrates was unrepentantly martyred for his commitment to open inquiry and free speech, his pursuit of truth as related in Plato's dialogue, The Apology, the account of his trial and condemnation, from which I quote here, Even if you acquitted me now, and said to me in this regard, Socrates, we acquit you, but only on condition that you spend no more time on this investigation and do not practice philosophy, and if you are caught doing so, you will die. If you were to acquit me on these terms, I would say to you, men of Athens, as long as I draw breath and am able, I shall not cease to practice philosophy. Whether you acquit me or not, do so on the understanding that this is my course of action, even if I am to face death many times. Socrates acknowledged that the only wisdom he could claim was the awareness of his own ignorance, an acknowledgement of the fundamental limitations of human knowledge. And now three more quotations from Plato's Apology, the account of Socrates' trial and conviction. What has caused my reputation for wisdom is none other than a certain kind of wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Human wisdom, perhaps. It may be that I really possess this, while those whom I mentioned just now are wise with a wisdom more than human. Else I cannot explain it, for I certainly do not possess it, and whoever says I do is lying and speaks to slander me. Next quote. I withdrew and thought to myself, I am wiser than this man. It is likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile. But he thinks he knows something, when he does not. Whereas when I do not know, neither do I think I know. So I am likely to be wiser than he, to this small extent, that I do not think I know what I do not know. Third quotation. To fear death, gentlemen, is no other than to think oneself wise when one is not, to think one knows what one does not know. No one knows whether death may not be the greatest of all blessings for a man, yet men fear it as if they knew that it is the greatest of evils. And surely, it is the most blameworthy ignorance to believe that one knows what one does not know. End of quotations. Wisdom, Socrates asserts, should always be tested against life as it is lived. For the purpose of philosophy is to live well. Knowledge can be divided into two realms, human knowledge which is open to intellects of our sort, and superhuman knowledge, which lies outside our capacity to know. Rational beings can, however, speculate. We think about what we cannot know, but we must never confuse the two. The starting place for human knowledge is intellectual humility, a recognition of our own ignorance, of our epistemic limitations, it is this self-conscious ignorance that constitutes Socratic wisdom. Intellectual arrogance, claiming to know what we do not know or cannot know, is a moral fault. Like Kant, who would follow Socrates on this point, while we cannot know, we can exercise a fully rational faith in speculative realms. Thus, Socrates' philosophical practice was essentially critical in nature. 
He tore down the ideas and conceptions of others, testing them and finding them wanting. But he never gave answers himself, never risked himself to criticism. It was this essentially critical function that I initially found repulsive. Philosophy must do more than tear down ideas. Socrates, I concluded, was a coward, never daring to offer his own ideas for consideration, only tearing down those of others. By contrast, Plato offered real answers to the serious questions that philosophy posed, and these answers were novel, engaging, and at least pointed to truth at an important level. Plato, then, is essentially philosophically constructive in nature. I identified Socrates' culturally destructive tendencies with the 60s radicals, whom I felt responsible for the deconstruction of our country in the following decades, for the malicious error and dishonesty I sensed poisoning our culture. Thus, when I began teaching my course, Plato was my hero, Socrates the villain. Plato's Republic is the first example of utopian writing we have. All would be well, Plato thought, if philosopher kings ruled, if rationality directed all things in the state, if each person performed the task they were most suited by nature to perform as determined by rationality, if division of labor and specialization were enforced from above to the benefit of the society as a whole, if the relationships between men, women, and children were rationalized rather than natural or traditional, if a central, rational authority controlled every aspect of life and culture. Plato taught that the harmonious individual, as a coordinated complex structure of parts, led by intellect, controlled and constrained by spirit, under the direction of intellect, with appetite driving the necessary and menial processes of life, was the ideal structure upon which the state, too, should be based. As I taught Intro to Philosophy over and over again, my understanding of Socrates and Plato's value altered radically. The more I learned about life, the world, and the nature of human knowledge, the more comprehensive and extensive my examination of the various fields of human inquiry, the more I found human knowledge to be necessarily subject to revision. I realized, that is, that Socrates was right to throw all human knowledge into question, as no matter how successfully we explain things to ourselves, we never get the story completely right. Being always expands beyond any container we create for it, beyond our limited human understanding. Plato's perfectly rational society, tried by Plato himself, failed, and the various incarnations of such a rationally centralized, or as we call it today, totalitarian state, have been disastrous every time they have been attempted since. A rational answer is not necessarily a true answer, as even the most carefully considered rational solution is blind to what it does not know, what it cannot consider or predict. Socrates found that the clearest instances of knowledge were those tried in the forge of life and practicality. Plato would have done well to heed Socrates' call to intellectual humility, to trying our ideals in the forge of life, of being, before giving ourselves over to them. In fact, Socrates' role became nearly all-important for me, as it taught me that intellect is fundamentally limited, that life, as it is lived, must be the testing ground for rational speculation, that wisdom derives from patterns of life that work, succeed, and that novelty must face the crucible of experience before it can be received and welcomed, and even then, welcomed only provisionally. This is not to say that philosophical speculation is wrong. Rather, the interplay of criticism and construction is a finely balanced dance, 
and it is the dance that matters, requiring, as it does, both partners. And the dance continues. Immanuel Kant would play Socrates to Enlightenment hubris, and Jean-Paul Sartre to Hegel's spirit. More on this in future editions. All too often, we human beings fall in love with our intellectual constructs and assume in our arrogance we can answer or have answered all questions, solved all problems. Here is the Academy's greatest failure when it becomes unbalanced and extreme, as it's been for decades in our country. This, too, is also the nature of political ideology today, as both left and right arrogantly claim to have a monopoly on truth and logic, that their opposition is both illogical and uninformed. It is the reason I declared to you that I gave up ideology when I returned to Christ in the first edition of The Christian Atheist. Understanding our world must be a constant reverberation between intellectual construction and intellectual humility. God calls us to the adventure of understanding and effectively living in his world. Together, Plato and Socrates form a functional unit, both persons necessary to maintain a living, breathing, and healthy structure. Neither is villain. Both are heroic. Or. Perhaps both are villain and neither heroic. As Solzhenitsyn said, quote, The line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. Jesus, the incarnate Word of God, The union of finite with infinite is the proper balance of human tendencies. And he is the paragon, the only pure human heart, opposed by both sides of the political and social divides. Jesus was both radical and conservative, and he was the rejected cornerstone upon which all existence stands. Socrates went willingly to his death for philosophy. Jesus, the Christ, for all of mankind. I honor both, but worship only one. I am a Christian, with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass, and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be Christian.